Anyone who is plugged into the fantasy reading community has likely already heard about the Wire article or uh, profile, I guess you could call it if you were being very, very generous. It's called Brandon Sanderson is Your God. It's written by Jason Cahey. It was published on March 23rd. It starts like this. He's the biggest fantasy writer in the world. He's also very Mormon. These things are profoundly related. The tone of that header tells you exactly what this article is. The words are carefully chosen to be sharp and unsettling and uncomfortable. This guy writes for a living, so there's no question that he chose these words on purpose. He wasn't just slamming words down on a page. Uh, when you write for a living, you choose your words carefully. Words mean things, and every word matters, and the way that it's used matters. So uh, going into this, just know that everything that he's saying and the way that he's saying it is done entirely on purpose. Most years, Brandon Sanderson makes about $10 million. Last year, he made $55 million. This is obviously a lot of money for anyone. For a writer of young adult-ish, never-ending, speed-written fantasy books, it's huge. By Sanderson's estimation, he's the highest-selling author of epic fantasy in the world. On the day of his record-breaking Kickstarter campaign, 42 million of that 55 million, I came to the Wired offices ready to gossip. How did he do it? Why now? Is Brandon Sanderson even a good writer? The author of the article goes on later to claim that he's read more than 10 Sanderson books, so shouldn't he already have an answer to his opinion on this? I'm confused. Okay, back to the Wired office. Nobody had the first clue who or what I was talking about. On the one hand, who cares? Sanderson has millions upon millions of fans all over the planet. It doesn't matter that some losers in a single magazine, even if it is one of the nerdier ones, had never heard of him. This was all over the news when it happened, like even mainstream media outlets covered it. I'm not sure. Uh... On the other hand, the ignorance goes far beyond Wired. As far as I can tell, Sanderson, who has been topping bestseller lists for the better part of the 21st century, has not been written about in any depth by any major publication ever. I called his publicist to confirm this. Well, we have a piece coming up in LDS Living, he told me. That's LDS as in Latter-day Saints. It's a magazine for Mormons. Which makes sense. Sanderson is extremely Mormon. How is one extremely Mormon? <laughs> okay, never mind, carry on, carry on. What makes less sense is why there's a hole the size of Utah where the man's literary reputation should be. Is it because he mostly writes fantasy, a, so the snobs near, sub-literary genre? My dude, y you are sneering in this article. Like, the whole article is a big sneer at both the fantasy fan base and fantasy authors, in particular Brandon Sanderson, but just the whole subculture in general, the whole article is this weird Regina George mean girl thing. All right, let's go. But then so do J.K. Rowling, Margaret Atwood, and George R.R. R. Martin, but they're household names. Is it because none of Sanderson's work has been adapted for the screen? Yeah. Well, he wrote three of the Wheel of Time books, and an adaptation of that series came out on Amazon Prime in 2021. Yeah, but he's not the main author, dude. Like, he was finishing a man's life work at the request of his widow. Like, when you think of Wheel of Time, you think of Robert Jordan. You don't think of Brandon Sanderson except as an afterthought. He was, he was doing something as a labor of love for someone else. Anyway, could it be... Finally, because he's a weirdo Mormon. Really? That's the word you're going to choose? Okay. But so are Orson Scott Card of Ender's Game, Glenn A. Larson, the original Battlestar Galactica, and Stephanie Meyer of Twilight. Mormon, I mean, only Orson Scott Card is also a weirdo. Sanderson, when I eventually meet him in person, makes versions of these excuses, plus others, for his writerly obscurity. 
it's kind of fun to talk about. Until it isn't. And that's when I realize, in a panic, that I now have a problem. Sanderson is excited to talk about his reputation. He's excited, really, to talk about anything, but none of his self-analysis is, for my purposes, exciting. In fact, at that first dinner over Flopsy Utah Chinese, this being days before I'd meet his extended family and attend his fan convention, and take his son to a theme park and cry in his basement, I find Sanderson depressingly, story-killingly lame. He sits across from me in an empty restaurant, kind of lordly and sure of his insights, in a graphic t-shirt and ill-fitting blazer, which he says he wears because it makes him look professorial. It doesn't. He isn't. Unless the word means only, believing everything you say is worth saying. My dude, you are there to interview him. Therefore, everything he says is worth saying. Would you prefer he just sat across the table from you and ate his dinner in silence? I'm not sure what you mean. I'd also like to hearken back to the fact that you said he's probably the best-selling fantasy author in the world and made $50 million writing books last year. If you're asking him about writing, what he has to say is worth saying. The man knows what he's talking about. Okay, carry on. Sanderson talks a lot, but almost none of it is usable or quotable. I begin to think, this is what I drove all the way from San Francisco to the suburbs of Salt Lake City in the freezing cold dead of winter for? And that sums up the entirety of the article. This guy thinks he's better than you. He thinks he's better than everybody. He thinks he's better than a $50 million a year author. He thinks he's better than the reader of the article he wrote. Uh, he just, he just thinks he's better. We're not worth his time or his effort or his energy. We're not worth him eating subpar meals in a city he doesn't appreciate with a man he thinks is lame. And I'm not sure what the purpose of the article is other than outrage media, you know. Setting fire, setting fire to the magazine for clicks. So, recklessly, I say what's on my mind. I have to. His wife is there, his biggest fan, always his first reader, making polite comments. I don't care. Maybe nobody writes about you, I say to Sanderson, because you don't write very well. Again, the guy has claimed later that he read ten of Sanderson's books. Shouldn't he already know what he thinks about Sanderson's prose? It's not that Brandon Sanderson can't write. It's more that he can't not write. Graphomania is the name of the condition, the constant compulsion to get words out, down as much and as quickly as possible. The concept of a vacation confuses Sanderson, he once said, because for him, the perfect vacation is more time to write. Vocation is vacation. Wouldn't we all just love to have a job that felt like we were on vacation? Like the thing that we make our living at is something we love doing so much that when we have the opportunity for time off, we just want to do more of it? Is that jealousy speaking? His schedule is budgeted down to the minute, months out, to maximize the time he spends, rather counter-ergonomically, on the couch typing away. Most days he wakes up at 1 p.m., exercises, and writes for four hours. Break for the wife and kids, then he writes for four more. After that he plays video games, or whatever, until 5 a.m. A powerful sleeping pill is all that works, finally, to get him, and the voices in his head, to shut up. In the five months or so it has taken me to sit down and write this magazine story, which is 4,000 words long, Sanderson has published two books. During the COVID lockdowns, he wrote and or edited seven. Two for his regular publisher, a graphic novel, and four more in secret, telling no one but his wife until he surprise announced a Kickstarter in March 2022 to crowdfund their publication. Hence the $42 million raised in a month, by far the most successful Kickstarter ever. Since his debut, Elantris, in 2005, Sanderson has published 30-plus books, the biggest ones in excess of 400,000 words. 
There are far more if you count the novellas and graphic novels and the stuff for kids. I've read 17 of the actual books. Okay, I stand corrected. I thought it was 10. Apparently he's read 17. Or maybe it's 20. Exactitude is pointless here. As the major books are all set in the same universe, which Sanderson calls the Cosmere, they're all but meant to blur together. Most will hear this and think, at that rate, none of the words could possibly be any good. My dude, have you heard of Stephen King? Okay. They'd be right in a way, and that's what Sanderson agrees with. At the sentence level, he is no great gift to English prose. There's more to telling a story than just the way you write a sentence. I mean, yes, prose matter, but prose improve over time. The reason Sanderson is so popular is because, on a fundamental level, the stories he tells and the people he tells them about are meaningful to his readers. They, they speak to his readers. They move them and excite them. And how do you not get that? How is this guy so well-read and yet doesn't understand that there's more to storytelling than just writing pretty sentences? The early books especially, my god, here's a sample sentence. It was going to be very bad this time. Another one. She felt a feeling of dread. There's a penchant for redundant description. A city is tranquil, quiet, peaceful. Many things, from building to beasts, are enormous. Dark places, more thesaurically, are collig colliginous? On almost every page of Mistborn, his first and probably most beloved series, a character sighs, frowns, raises an eyebrow, cocks a head, shrugs, or snorts, sometimes at the same time, sometimes multiple times on a page. I count seven books in which one of the characters frets about their metaphors, I have trouble with metaphors, one literally says. Of his own work, Sanderson has said, I detest rewriting. I write for endings, and I write to relax. It shows. He writes, by one metric, at a sixth grade reading level. Writing journalism is different than writing novels. It's often recommended that you write simpler sentences than are necessary to convey the point. In general, the simpler the better, because it opens your books to a broader audience and therefore makes them more marketable. Is he like a litfic bro or something? What is going on? Here's where I'll stop using Sanderson's words, written or spoken, against him. Oh yes, that's definitely what you should do. We are reading an article about Brandon Sanderson, but we don't want to hear from him. We want to know your opinion. Again, Brandon Sanderson is one of the most popular fantasy authors in the world, certainly in modern publishing. If he's taking the time to talk to you about writing, it's probably worth listening to, even if you personally find him boring. What this tells me is that this journalist was not the right person to write this article. If you don't already appreciate and enjoy fantasy, if you don't see the purpose of it, and if you don't understand why those stories matter to people beyond just pretty prose, you're probably not the right person to write the article. Like his books, it all blurs together. I type some 40 pages of notes for this story, and who knows how many pages of transcripts the AI spat out when I fed it the many hours of recorded video. Now that I'm writing, I find I'm referring to none of it. Possibly this is the influence of Sanderson himself on me. Graphomaniacally get the thoughts down. Have fun. Write the ending. Yes, please, get to the ending. So I will. This story has an ending, I promise, and I'm sprinting towards it as if to a vacation. Like the best of Sanderson's endings, my ending should surprise you. I think I'll be the judge of that. Because, you see, Sanderson actually did say one thing to me. One miraculous thing that stuck, that I remember, these five months later, with perfect clarity. Just seven words, but true ones. You're not ready for them just yet. How pretentious are you? You need more story first. 
For now, there is only Sanderson, both wordful and wordless. The best-selling writer no one writes about because writers only know how to talk about words. Isn't that the point of the article? You think his sentences are bad. Sanderson's readers, loving Legion, care about something else. Ten seconds to go until launch. The lights are flashing, the music thumping. This is sick, someone whispers behind me, as a Cosmere's worth of nerds count down the remaining seconds. At zero, an enormous applause, then the VP of Merchandising and Events walks out. This is Dragonsteel 2022, the second annual convention for Sanderson's worlds and works. At the first one, the year before, 1,200 fans showed up. At this event, a two-dayer in November, attendance is closer to 5,000. Even though the con is being held in the biggest venue in downtown Salt Lake City, the Salt Palace Convention Center, fans are turned away from panels left and right. The first morning, I was panting by the time I reached the end of the line, down multiple city blocks abutting stony Mormon Gothica. Some 7,000 people are expected for Dragonsteel 2023, the VP of Merch and Events tells me later. And in 2024, the year Sanderson plans to release Book 5 of 10 of the Stormlight Archives, his biggest franchise, the one with the 400,000 word books, a full 12,000 people. The Dragonsteel planners will need to think bigger. For now, the fans, even the turned away ones, are in unconquerable spirits. As is typically the case at these things, there's a general air, warmish, body odored, of unself consciousness. My dude, how are you gonna go into a space where people feel safe and are just there to enjoy themselves and make fun of them? Haven't we gotten past this by now? I understand you're a fancy boy from Los Angeles, but like, for real, these people are, have traveled miles. They're just, they're just there to have a good time. Like, who are you to go into their space and make fun of them for just enjoying a thing? How dare you? Okay, back to the article. By my rough count, some three quarters of the attendees are men. Boys. Men boys. Blurring together in a mass of pale, fleshy nerdery in Sanderson appropriate graphic tees. The women, fewer in number, tend to be the better cosplayers. Is, is that how we're measuring people now? Not how much they're enjoying a thing or you know, the fact that they're excited, it's how fancily they're dressed, that's how we're judging things? Okay. Lots of billowing cloaks, sprightly makeup, precious weapons. There's an arena for refereed fights, and if you don't come prepared, never fear, because the sprawl of purchasable Sandersonalia is endless. Again, this is a business. Art, clothes, figurines, games, jewelry, ornaments, special edition books, a letter opener, not available yet, in the style of a telepathic sword named Nightblood. I talk to as many of the fans as I can, some in their teens, others in their 60s, from here in Utah and as far away as India, Norway, Australia. They're sweet. Yes, because we don't understand a thing, certainly the people who appreciate it are childish and we must infantilize them. Okay. Many of them have been reading Sanderson since the beginning, since Elantris. A teenage girl announces, I'm here basically because I'm a huge nerd. Everyone is smiling, sharing info and panel gossip. One guy from Massachusetts tells me he just spent $170 on a rubber sword. Not Nightblood, this one is called Maelaren. It's bigger than he is, he won't be able to take it on the plane home. You know they're shipping, right? Like, that's a thing we have in 2023? Okay. Another man, 41 years old, tells me he made his sword, Firestorm. They all have names. Again, pretty typical of fantasy. I'm not sure where you're lost here, especially since you claim to know the subculture. It took more than a year on and off to design and then six weeks to 3D print. I see a young couple with very young kids. Are you indoctrinating them into the fantasy land? I ask, gesturing to the stroller. Trying to, the dad says. The one question I ask practically everyone is, why Sanderson? 
I only need to ask it a few times to realize the answer is always the same. It's a two-parter. First part, Sanderson's characters. They feel like real people, everyone insists. Multiple parents say they've named their kids after their favorites, usually the princely protagonists who've overcome various depressions and triumphed chivalrically. I've done some things I'm not proud of, one man tells me. Then he reads the first Stormlight book, The Way of Kings, and now, reformed, he has a two-year-old son named Kaladin. The second answer to why Sanderson is his worlds. This is probably what he's best known for. World building, as it's called. Sanderson dreams up far-off lands, sometimes cities, sometimes whole planets, with rules and systems and politics, and then he populates them with characters whose fates are also the worlds. So the second answer is just an inverse of the first. You can't have world building without character building. Some characters die, some become gods. The good ones, and most of them are good, are very good. Inspiringly good. No one has sex. They only save lives. I don't think this guy understands fantasy. World building is an inherent part of the fantasy genre. Not sex... And yeah, in general, we like our heroes to be heroic, that's kind of why we call them heroes. What nobody, not a single person, complains about in my two days walking the palace floors is Sanderson's writing. If they mention his sentences at all, it's merely to acknowledge that they're easier to read than, say, Tolkien's, whose work they may well graduate to, with Sanderson lighting the way. Are. You. Kidding. How can you be so snide about Sanderson's world-building and the fact that that is his strength, and then compare him, like, straight face to Tolkien and act like Tolkien is not also known for his world-building? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I've collected myself back to the article. Sanderson himself admits he was late to Tolkien, in whose shadow he now happily lives, even as he tries to write beyond it. Still, I can't help but try to trip them up. Why can't you just go and enjoy and appreciate a thing? Why do you have to try to break it? Why do you have to try to poke it? Why do you have to try to, like, open it up and dig around? You aren't wanted or welcome there. Surely he's not a great writer, I prod. Polite, embarrassed smiles. They're suspicious of me. I can tell. Or maybe it's just that the people you're talking to are more polite than you are. I think they're embarrassed for you. They probably think I don't know my Kaladin from my Adolin. I do. I even like Kaladin. The scene midway through Way of Kings, where Kaladin talks to a mysterious stranger, it's Hoyd, on the Shattered Plains. A story doesn't live until it is imagined in someone's mind, Hoyd says. Do I know what that means? Not exactly. And that's exactly why I read science fiction and fantasy. Do you, though? Why I've pretty much only read science fiction and fantasy my entire life, for those plays at profundity, at the essence of storytelling. Storytelling beyond words. If you get that concept, why does this article exist? But what am I saying? Gibberish, most likely, and hypocrisies. Yeah. Sanderson is a bad writer. I've already said it. Here, at the convention, most of the panelists aren't even writers. People don't care about sentences. They care about Sanderson. No, sir. People don't care about sentences. They care about world-building and characters and stories. And that is so far beyond prose. Prose matter, but not as much as the story itself. And the story itself is beyond the words that are used to tell it. How do you not understand that after saying something like storytelling beyond words? How do you get it and not get it at the same time? I don't understand. I sit through multiple panels about the future of his publishing company, which is called, as is the convention, you'll note, Dragonsteel. Post-Kickstarter campaign, the company is now 50-some people slash Mormons strong. 
Why does it matter the faith of the people he's hiring? He lives in Utah, for crying out loud. This is the year of Sanderson that the panels keep saying, I would say with a 40 million Kickstarter, they're not far off. Four new books with special swag for backers, new toys and sparkly bookmarks. Now they're talking about warehouse expansion efforts. Now they're talking about a possible future bookstore housed in a castle or something. When will the Dragonsteel amusement park be built, someone asks. The audience hoots. All this, I think to myself, is not the spirit of fantasy. If it's world building, it's only world building one thing. The world builder's world. Sir, do you not understand how franchises work? Like, it, it's IP, it's marketable, it's a thing that the guy makes money off of and, like, employs, as you said, 50-some people. Like, <laughs> merchandise is income, income creates jobs. Like, what? How do you not understand the business model? <laughs> it's not that complicated. Is this why magazines are failing? Okay. Three days later, I pull up to Sanderson's built world, his homes in a gated community of American Fork, Utah. There are three properties. On the left is the newest one, the subterranean man cave, unofficially known as the supervillain lair. Officially, the Ammonite Club, complete with 28-seat industry-caliber movie theater, the middle structure is the Sanderson family manor, where his three boys play. On the right is the Cosmere House, which serves as Dragonsteel's headquarters. Props and merch and books for days. That's where I'm staying, specifically in the Elantra suite. It has cover art from the books on the walls, gold and silver frilly things everywhere, and the world's best shower. I already knew about the shower because a few nights earlier I'd gone out for drinks with a friend of Sanderson's I met at the con. Why are we talking about a shower? What has this got to do with Sanderson? After contextualizing Sanderson's success for me, basically he gives fans exactly what they want, maybe you should try to do that too. She insisted I stay a night in the Elantra suite, and you have to try the shower, she said. I'll text him. The next morning, I woke up to an invitation from his assistant. Sanderson's assistant is his wife's sister. I can't tell if he's, like, mocking the fact that the guy employs people who are already close to him, or, like, is it the nepotism that bothers him? Is it is it because he has people he actually trusts and isn't operating as a as a lone wanderer through the through the wastes i don't i don't get it like the man has friends and family who are exci as excited about what he does as he is like surely that's a good thing right as i orient myself within the cosmere house i keep running into his nearest and dearest his doppelganger brother multiple siblings-in-law neighbors people's children friends sanderson formed a writers group with almost 30 years ago back in college at brigham young university when he was a nobody and worked the graveyard shift at a hotel so he could write the nights away dragonsteel is a company one that's shaking up the book industry it's also sanderson's extended family good for him the writers' group still meets every Friday, which is what today happens to be. It's the most PG gathering of writer types I've ever been to. My dude, you are in Utah. There are chips and sodas. Someone's baked an apple crisp. Before the meetup kicks off, I corner some regulars in the kitchen. They're gossiping, cracking jokes. One, Dragonsteel's new head of narrative, lets slip that Sanderson feels no pain. It's true, Sanderson's sister-in-law says, even though he writes for eight hours a day on a couch, he has no backaches. The hottest of hot sauces cause scarcely a sweat. At the dentist, he refuses Novocaine for fillings, and when I ask Sanderson later to confirm this, he does but asks if I really have to print it. I'm sorry, I say. I really do. No, sir, you did not. It's not relevant to his writing or his success as an author. The only reason to include this in the article is because you want to make him look weird. Basically, you're making fun of a dude for a quirky condition he has no control over it and is clearly embarrassed about. What is wrong with you? The writer's group is standard stuff. What's this character's motivation? Can the reader follow that fight sequence? 
Sanderson gives feedback with half his brain, the other half occupied with autographing books. How much brain power do you think it takes for a man who creates literal universes in his mind to sign his name a few thousand times? I'm guessing not much. It's only afterward that the real talk happens, such as Star Wars debates. When those subside, I bring up the pain thing again. Are you kidding me? So not only has he very clearly telegraphed social cues to you that he is uncomfortable talking about this, especially in front of other people, he's all but asks you not to print it, and then you bring it up in front of a room full of his friends? What is wrong with you? Turns out Sanderson doesn't seem to feel pain of any kind, even emotional. On roller coasters, he's dead-faced while his wife is shrieking. It's sick and wrong, she says, smiling. Get the hint. They are trying to give you social cues to ask you to back off this topic. She's making a joke because she's uncomfortable. She likes to say she's married to an android. For his part, Sanderson, actually, at this moment, looks pained. He might not feel, he says, but his characters do. They agonize and cry and rejoice and love. That's one of the reasons he writes, he says, to feel human. I don't understand how he could write that sentence and not understand how heartbreaking it is. I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand how you can go into someone's home and, and have them reveal themselves to you in this way, be vulnerable to you in this way, and still write whatever this is. I don't get it. The conversation eventually turns to a theme park called Evermore, located just down the street. Though unaffiliated with Sanderson, it's Sandersonian to the core. You show up, hang around in taverns, and embark on quests. We have to go, I say. But it's falling apart, everyone groans. Something to do with bad management. There's a four-hour YouTube all about it. Still, Sanderson seems tempted. That's because he's trying to be nice to you. Even though you have shown no social grace in this situation, he's still doing his best to be a polite host. We leave it at that. I go back to the Elantra suite where I finally take that shower. There are multiple shower heads. I turn everything on. Water hits me from every angle. I don't cry, but I could. The article isn't about you. Or at least, I don't think it's supposed to be. I do cry the next night, my last in Utah. We're down in Sanderson's below-ground movie theater in plush red leather seats that do not only recline, but also have adjustable headrests. He wants to show the specs off, so he plays the opening scene of The Greatest Showman. I don't tell him that, while I like musicals, I hate The Greatest Showman, and especially Hugh Jackman. The scene starts, the chair shakes with otherworldly sound, when Hugh, lame Hugh, opens his mouth to sing, I can't help it. I burst into tears. It's almost like you can be emotionally affected by an imperfect thing. Like, I don't know, amazing fantasy books with incredible characters and epic world building that might have subpar prose. Who'd have thunk it? What's happening to me? The story isn't coming together. To my mind, I still haven't gotten anything real from Sanderson. Anything true. Are you serious? I'm not the first person he has toured around his lair to politely gawk at his treasures and trophies and his hallway of custom stained glass renditions of his favorite books. I'm certainly not the first person he has told about one favorite book in particular. Barbara Hambly's Dragon's Bane, which an English teacher put in his hands when he was 14, probably the day he became a fantasy writer. Or how he first got published. Or about the phone call he got from Robert Jordan's widow asking if he might finish the Wheel of Time series. These stories are all over the internet, on his website, and many others. Sanderson has lived so much of his life and fame openly, self-promotionally. It's a major reason for his success. One woman I talked to at the con made sure to tell me which of Sanderson's pets was her favorite. It's Jello the Parrot. 
After I recover from Hugh in 4D, Sanderson collects his 15-year-old, and we all drive to dinner. This time, the food is better. Utah Japanese. Sanderson and I order ramen, he salts his, then I watch his son salt his yakisoba. I could cry again. How pretentious are you? The kid is 15. Let him eat this food how he likes to eat it. My word. Instead, I ask Sanderson if he's ever so moved by a scene that he writes that he cries. Sometimes, he says, though it might not be the scenes people expect. He won't say more, but it's something. This conversation, from five months ago, remember, I recall fairly clearly. We're heading towards something now, some kind of admission. I can feel it. When Mormons ask God for a sign, they speak of it burning in the bosom. Say you're a kid, wondering if you should be a fantasy writer when you grow up. You might ask God what he thinks. If there's a burning in your bosom, that's probably a yes. So I press Sanderson on the moments he has felt the burning. He says they're too intimate, too special to talk about. That's fine. We talk about Mormonism in another way. Are you grilling the man about his faith in front of his 15-year-old son? Did I read that right? Oh, oh yeah, you are. Excellent. Excellent discretion. Good job, Jason. Good job. Let's talk about Mormonism in another way. Let's talk about it as it relates to fantasy, because it's no secret, Mormonism is the fantasy of religion. Really? You couldn't go this whole article without cracking on the guy's faith? Really? So when you hear people talk about California elitism, this is what they're talking about. And I'm not saying that all people from California are like this, but this guy? My word. The science fiction edition of Christianity, I've heard it called. By whom? And it's angels and alternative histories, embodied gods, visions, and plates made of gold. Have you read the Bible? I ask Sanderson if I've got the ultimate promise of the religion right. The ultimate promise being, as I understand it, that we humans will, if we're good and marry well and memorize the passcodes, eventually pass into the highest kingdom and come into our divine inheritance. We'll become gods, in other words, and get our own planets. Sanderson doesn't balk at the characterization. I doubt that. He's just subtle and too polite to tell you to fuck off. He agrees that's the gist, and he knows where I'm going. Again, he's too polite to push himself away from the table, pick up his son, and leave you sitting there, which you rightly deserved. He knows I want to know if what he's doing, writing fantasy books, is fundamentally, in some way, some very central way, Mormon. Of course it is, he said. The world building, the gods incarnate, the systems of magic. So much of Mormonism is about rules. So are his books, where miracles don't happen unless you put in the work. That's when, between mouthfuls of pork cutlet, why are you going out of your way to try and describe this man in the worst possible way? Oh, sorry, there's a little bit of storm going on, but I understand he's a little bit dorky. I get it. He's not this slick, posh, L.A. superstar that you're used to dealing with, but is there no generosity in you to make room for people who are different than yourself? None. That's when, between mouthfuls of pork cutlet, Sanderson makes a connection between his works and the work of his Heavenly Father explicit. This is when he speaks the seven words of truth, the only ones I'm certain he has ever said in quite this way ever before. As I build books, as Sanderson says, as I sit there for once entirely enraptured, God builds people. Brandon Sanderson writes and speaks words for a living. He spends all day either speaking to people about things like this or writing things like this. There is no possible way this is the first time he has conveyed this sentiment to another human being. It may be the first time he's ever conveyed it to an audience with the motivations that you have. That is certainly possible. 
We descend on one final world. After dinner, it's time for Evermore, the rundown theme park. The night is misty and cold. Caligonous. I remember one of Sanderson's friends saying the park is open only at night so as to conceal the decay. I believe it. As we walk around, Sanderson narrates, Those are bad prosthetics. That's half a costume. Shouldn't there be more skeletons in this dungeon? At least the apple cider is good. So basically, at this point, you have so offended and alienated and weirded out this guy that you're supposed to be interviewing that he's just making small talk? No wonder you can't get anything real out of anybody. He gets recognized by everybody. I thought you said he was obscure and nobody knew who he was. Oh, right. It was just that you and your friends didn't know who he was. Obviously, he's nobody. I guess that's inevitable when you go to a fantasy land with a fantasy legend who has literally just purchased a five million plot of land across the way for who knows what world building reasons. It's his money. He can spend it how he wants. Sanderson's son and I start keeping a silent tally. Every time a new fan walks over, he holds up fingers behind Sanderson's back. We quickly run out of fingers. So this kid is proud of his father and all you've done the whole time is grill him about his faith and make nasty, snide remarks about how you think Sanderson is comparing himself to God. Brilliant. The Innocence of Youth One girl says she wants to take Sanderson's writing class at BYU when she grows up. Good luck, my dear. It's very, very competitive. A surprising number of guys ask for autographs for my girlfriend. Is that to say that, like, nerds can't have partners? Like, what? <laughs> What is going on? Like, you, you, you think those of us who are a little, a little dorky can't get any? Is that what you're saying? Because, uh, yeah. Lots of people have already finished the latest book, which came out, like, yesterday. It came out a few weeks ago. I'm not sure how slow of a reader you are, but... Sanderson shines in these situations. He's your god, but he's your friend, too. What? He's also unafraid to drop hints about future projects. He does this to me at certain points. Will they ever make a big movie version of one of your books? I ask him in the fairy garden. Sanderson makes meaningful noises. Even though your system of magic seem unfilmably complex, more meaningful noises. Everything's been optioned, he says, but then things revert and discussions continue. That's pretty typical. I suspect there will be big announcements soon. There have to be. Sanderson is bigger than ever. A good writer? Who knows? What I do know now is this. So many of us mistake sentences for story. But story is the thing. Things happening. Characters changing. Surprise endings. As I drive back to the house, drop off the kid, and then stay in the car with Sanderson a bit longer, talking about life, talking about worlds, my ending takes shape. The surprise is that it was Sanderson's ending all along. The ending of his best books. A character becomes a god, and the god beholds his planet below. If Sanderson is a writer, that is all he's doing. He is living his fantasy of godhead on Earth. I think you can tell how I feel about the article. It's all very high school girl bully, like very mean girls. Like the whole time I was reading the article, I felt like Jason was sort of leaning over with a little elbow to the ribs like, oh, I got him. I got him. Aren't I cool? Like, like he's trying to get in with the cool crowd in school. And I don't understand who this article is for. The only people who would be searching for an article on Brandon Sanderson are Brandon Sanderson fans. Clearly, the people at Wired don't know anything about him, so the fan bases or the the audiences don't intersect. Like, So the Wired audience isn't looking for articles on Brandon Sanderson. They're not going to care. And the people who already appreciate Brandon Sanderson, or at the very least, appreciate the... Uh, revitalization that he has contributed to the fantasy genre 
they're certainly not going to enjoy the article. They're not supposed to. You're making fun of them the whole time. Like, who is this written for? Moreover, who do you think is going to give you an interview after writing this? The man invited you into his home. He let you hang out with his children. Who is going to let you in? Who is going to open up? Who is going to give you something real as you claim to, to need in order to write a decent article? Who is going to do that for you? When this, this is how, this is how you show your appreciation. This is how you represent him. Like, I, I don't understand. So, as you might guess, the ever-plugged-in Sanderson has written a response to the article, and uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it straight through, because I think the difference in tone shows the difference in motivations between these two men, uh, both the journalist and the novelist. So, let's just, uh, let's just read this through. It is in r slash Brandon Sanderson, and it's called On the Wired Article, No Spoilers. All. I appreciate the kind words and support. Not sure how or if I should respond to the Wired article. I get that Jason, in writing it, felt incredibly conflicted about the fact that he finds me lame and boring. I'm baffled how he seems to find every single person on his trip, my friends, my family, my fans, to be worthy of derision. But he also feels sincere in his attempt to try and understand. While he legitimately seems to dislike me and my writing, I don't think that's why he came to see me. He wasn't looking for a hit piece. He was looking to explore the world through his writing. In that, he and I are the same, and I respect him for it, even if much of his tone seems quite dismissive of many people and ideas I care deeply about. The strangest part for me is how Jason says he had trouble finding the real me. He says he wants something true or genuine, but he had the genuine me all that time. He really did. What I said apparently wasn't anything he found useful for writing an article. That doesn't make it not genuine or true. I am not offended that the true me bores him. Honestly, I'm a guy who enjoys his job, loves his family, and is a little obsessive about his stories. There's no hidden trauma, no skeletons in my closet, just a guy trying to understand the world through story. And I'm sorry about the distortion here, there's a massive storm going on outside. That is kind of boring from an outsider's perspective. I can see how it is difficult to write an article about me for that reason. But at the same time, I'm worried about the way he treats our entire community. I understand that he didn't just talk about me, but about you. As has been happening to fantasy fans for years, the general attitude of anyone writing about us is that we should be ashamed for enjoying what we enjoy. In that, the tone feels like it was written during the 80s. Look at these silly nerds liking things. How dare they like things? Don't they know the thing they like is dumb? As a community, let's take a deep breath. It's all right. I appreciate you standing up for me, but please leave Jason alone. This might feel like an attack on us, on you, but it's not. Jason wrote what he felt he needed, and as a writer, he is my colleague. Please show him respect. He should not be attacked for sharing his feelings. If we attack people for doing so, we make the world a worse place, because fewer people will be willing to be their authentic selves. That said, let me say one thing. You, my friends, are not boring or lame. In Going Postal, one of my favorite novels, Sir Terry Pratchett has a character fascinated by collecting pins. Not pins like you might think, there aren't Disney pins or character pins, they're pins like tacks used to pin things to walls. Outsiders find it difficult to understand why he loves them so much, but he does. In the books, pins are a stand-in for collecting stamps, but also the commentary on the way we, as human beings, are constantly finding wonder in the world around us. That is part of what makes us special. The man who collects those pins, Stanley Howler, is special. In part 
because of his passion, and the more you get to know him, or anyone, the more interesting you find them. This is a truism of life. People are interesting, every one of them, and being a writer is about finding out why. In that way, the ability to make Stanley interesting is part of what makes Pratchett a genius, in my opinion. That's writing. Not merely using words. It's what I aspire to be able to do. People are wonderful, fascinating, brilliant balls of walking contradiction, passion, and beauty. I find it an exciting challenge to make certain that the perspective of the washerwoman or the monk sitting and reading a book is as interesting in a story as that of a king or a tech mogul. And I find value in you. Your passion for my work is a big part of why I write. You make my life special. Thank you. Note, I do want to make it clear again that I bear Jason no ill will. I like him. Please leave him alone. He seems to be a sincere man who tried very hard to find a story, discovered that there wasn't one that interested him, then floundered in trying to figure out what he could say to make Deadline. I respect him for trying his best to write what he obviously found a difficult article. He's a person, remember? Just like each of us. In his response, Brandon Sanderson demonstrates a tremendous amount of class and extends grace to the journalist that was not extended to him. Kindness in the face of nastiness and generosity of spirit in the face of someone who just spent 4,000 words tearing apart him and his family and the things that he loves and cares about. So I'm going to let that sit there, and uh, I'll uh, see you next Tuesday. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, and of course, if you like the way that I present information, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. You can find all of my social media contacts in the description, and of course, if you want to keep up with me and the progress I'm making on my current novel, you can do that at effiewritesbooks.com. Thank you so much for watching, have an excellent day, and I'll see you next time.